I will usually uh, pick, I mean, sometimes I do John 3, 16, I guess, but if somebody doesn't want to listen to the gospel presentation, oftentimes we all have a practice of saying, well, could I just leave you with one verse before I go? <clears throat> and then we'll leave them information from the church and we'll quote to them, you know, sometimes I'll do John 3, 16, but usually I do 1 John 5, 13, you know, for somebody that says, yeah, I don't think anybody can know that you're going to heaven. I want them to know what we've already covered that one, right? Where it says you... Uh, I write these things unto you that you may know. <clears throat> the other one that I do a lot is Ephesians 2, 8, 9, which I've always ca thought was funny because I said, if I could just leave you with one verse, and then I actually leave them with two. But you know, <laughs> Ephesians 2, 8, 9, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself is the gift, of, not of yourself is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, and we say that one for those who would think that uh, they could get to heaven through their works. You know, they if you ask them if they know for sure they're going to heaven, and they say, well, yeah, I'm pretty good. You know, I've got I got it figured out and love my neighbors and do all that kind of stuff. And if they don't want to listen to the presentation, I'll often leave them with this verse. Okay, so we found ourselves here um, as one of the verses that we'll quote, another great verse. I'll continue to use it. But we want to look at it for the sake of this series. We want to look at it in the context. And so we're going to look at... Uh, actually, Ephesians 1 through 3, we'll be looking at various uh, things in there. And then uh, 4, chapter 4, basically starts a new section where he says, Therefore, you know, the, uh, the prisoner, I therefore, as a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation. And he goes on telling them how they're supposed to live the Christian life. Uh, but the first three chapters is basically just saying, hey, this is who I'm writing to. I'm writing to believers. And he's explaining what the believers are. And, and, and it's kind of just full of just these wonderful passages. In fact, uh, it's full of these great doctrinal truths that men to this day debate over. You know, a lot of them are found right here in the first three chapters of Ephesians. And once again, I've, I've shared this in the previous uh, lessons. Um, I don't know which one, but 2 Peter 3.16 in uh, regards to the writings of Paul, Peter says, uh, as also in all his epistles, talking about Paul, speaking in them of, of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they, W-R-E-S-T, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So I think it's interesting that he points out specifically that the writings of Paul are hard to just understand just naturally just pick it up read it and understand it and it says these unlearned men uh you know will twist them and rest them and and uh, make them fit whatever they want it to say people are doing that to this day with paul's writings and there's a lot of uh crazy doctors out there we'll talk about some of them in this uh less in this message here but here are just a few examples just in chapter two alone you could preach on the doctrine of the new birth on uh the eternality and the omnipresence of god uh, you could talk about, here's a real touchy situation, uh, a subject, the for ordination and predestination of the believers. We'll talk about that just a little bit. Uh, we It covers what I would call covenant theology. Uh, some people would say church replacement. I think covenant theology is better. Uh, it covers the Trinity. It talks about all these persons of the Godhead, including the Holy Spirit. Uh not Mary. I was just talking. <laughs> just talked to, on Thursday. We talked about Mary uh, and how some of the weird views that people have about Mary. And I was reminding Brother David about the lady I knocked on her door, and she said, "Oh yeah, I'm going to heaven." I said, "Well, what do you base that assurance on?" And she's like, "Well, I believe in God and Jesus and Mary." <laughs> and so I thought that's funny. She just she left out the Holy Ghost and went straight to Mary, <laughs> which uh, you know, just saying I believe in God assumes that you believe God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But what we want them to tell, of course, is that they believe in Jesus Christ for their salvation. They trusted in Him for their salvation, but uh, a lot of times they don't understand that. So there's all these uh, uh, interesting doctrines, the doctrine of sanctifications in there. And I'm not going to go through and explain all these. Um, I don't think it's going to be a, a, a terribly deep message. I did warn that it's 10 points. And I said yesterday after the candlelight service, I preached a message that was 45 seconds. You heard that right. Not minutes, seconds. We had a long candlelight service. I, I mean, it wasn't, even the candlelight service wasn't long. But afterwards, I was like, you know, I'm just going to let the music and the, uh, the Bible reading and all speak for itself. And so I didn't give a whole long of an explanation. And so I said, you know, but that's right. I'm going to make up for it. Today's message has 10 points. 
And somebody said, well, why are you going to punish us? You should never look at preaching of God's word as punishment. <laughs> I know, I know it was a joke. But recently somebody on Facebook posted something about that, about uh, preachers, they can preach short or something like that. And this guy who is a missionary in Zambia or Zambia, and he said, uh, he said, you know, that would be offensive here if you if you wrapped up your sermon in one hour, which our messages, I mean, our services, entire service usually lasts about an hour here and in Kansas City, uh, maybe a tad bit over an hour. And he said, because people have to walk sometimes for hours and hours, they'll walk all the way to get to service. And then the start time is kind of staggered. People don't always show up at the same time. And, uh, you know, they come and they're ready to hear the Bible being preached. And if you quit in an hour, he said, they'd be offended. <laughs> you know, uh, go back to uh, Paul. You know, he preached till midnight. Eutychus fell asleep and fell out of a window. <laughs> anyway, 10 points. <laughs> but we're not going to go. Uh, they're not going to be super long. Because here's the crux of what the book of Ephesians is about, these first three chapters at least, uh, uh, contrary to what we normally use it for, we usually go to a lost person and say, well, according to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, here's how you can be saved, right? And it's not wrong for us to say it that way, but really the context is, you know, you are saved. And then Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is just like, you know, by the way, this is how you were saved. It's just kind of like a sec, uh, you know, you already know this, but let me just throw this in there. And uh, so uh, that's what we've got going on here. In fact, in this passage, look at chapter 1, verse 1, Ephesians 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Okay, so you're, you're not only talking to people that are saved in the Bible. Those who are saved are called saints. It's not people who have done a whole lot of amazing works and given to the poor and all that that are called saints. Saints are simply those who are sanctified by Jesus Christ. Uh, you could argue that there's a sanctification process where we're in this flesh being made holy and righteous. I'll, I'll kind of address that a little bit in this message, I think. And uh, But anyway, he's talking to Christians, but then he also says and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, sometimes we use the word faithful uh, to mean somebody who is loyal, you know, somebody who will continue to be there. You can trust them. They're faithful. And I don't think that's a bad, uh, a bad way to use that. But I think a lot of times when the Bible says the word faithful, it simply means full of faith, right? So they trusted in Jesus Christ. They're faithful. They're the ones who had faith and uh, trusted Christ. And so uh, these are the ones who he's talking to. So he's talking to believers. And throughout these first three chapters, he hits on basically what it means to be saved. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through all the points are going to be different words or descriptions that he uses here to talk about people who are saved. And through all of those, I think we can derive a little bit of some doctrinal truths without going into some deep, uh, confusing things. We can just look at what he says here in these descriptions. Okay, so number one, I already mentioned the word saint. Uh, look at verse 15 of that same chapter. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. Many times in the Bible, it talks about, you know, those who are believers will naturally, you know, love their brothers and sisters in Christ. They'll love other saints because we're a family. And now it doesn't mean that sometimes uh, people won't butt heads because they do. We're human. And uh, sometimes, you know, we just can't get along with somebody. Our personalities are different or someone did somebody wrong and we can't let it go. Uh, I've preached on those uh, thing, things about that uh, scenario many times, but here, He's talking about, you know, I heard of your love for the saints, which should be a natural thing that believers do. Look at chapter 2, verse 19. Chapter 2, verse 19 says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. I'll come back to this verse or verses like this. Uh, in a minute, but basically he's saying, you know, you guys are fellow citizens with the saints. He's saying you are saints as well, just like they are. Okay, so the word saints, it's not talking about earning your sainthood status like the Catholic Church would say by doing certain works. I believe uh, there are several things they have to do to become a saint, and one of them is to do some kind of miracle in their lifetime or 
after they're dead. So there are some people who never were uh, uh, put into sainthood by the Pope or whoever declares their sainthood. And after their death, they'll be like, oh, well, they didn't do any miracles. And then you'll have somebody to claim that the statue started crying or something like that. And they'll say, oh, there's a miracle. Now so-and-so can become a saint. It's kind of strange, okay? Uh, but those are what a lot of people talk about or think about when you say saint. You know, they'll say, they'll say well, well, you're not a saint yourself. Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I'm uh, the inner man is spotless in Christ, is sanctified, it's holy. Uh, we just need to remind the body about that every once in a while. That's kind of what uh, we're talking about here. All right, so uh, notice that being f a saint has to do with chapter 1, verse 1, being faithful, having faith, right? Putting your faith in Jesus Christ, that's how you become a saint. Uh, verse 15, he says, I heard of your faith. Okay, so being a saint has to do with believing in, in Jesus Christ. Being, or verse Chapter 2, verse 8, here's our text that we're considering. For by grace are you saved through faith. And all throughout this, this uh, book, as he's talking to believers here, he's, he mentions their faith and their sainthood. Number two, he uses several times, I'm going to lump all these together, but chosen, ordained, predestinated, and the word's not in here, but elect. Now, those are scary words if, you're, if you are into theology and you've ever uh, debated with people who maybe from a Calvinistic or Presbyterian background um, because there's some fights that break out when you start talking about predestination and election and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> well, I'm going to try to break that down really quickly and make it as easy as I can. First of all, in the context here, as you're reading through this, these chapters and you come to this idea of being predestinated, in the context, what he's talking about are the fact that Gentiles, it was planned from the beginning that Gentiles would eventually be able to come into that sainthood. They would, you know, not always anybody could be saved from the very beginning. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And anybody could, and we see all throughout the Old Testament, uh, Gentiles who came into even the lineage of Christ and those uh, who converted to Judaism in that day. But the thing was, it was specifically towards those people and about a, a, a kingdom. You know, they, they, they just thought that God's going to bless their line and there's going to be a kingdom. They didn't realize that those, those pro prophecies were going to be fulfilled through Jesus Christ. They didn't completely understand that in the way that Christ's first coming was going to be. So he's talking to Gentiles who are now saved. And he's saying, you know, you were predestined. In other, words, Gentile, in other words, Gentiles were, it was predestined that they would be the ones who would eventually, uh, you know, the, the, the gospel would go into the whole world. That was always the, even to the Jews, it was like, you're going to be a light unto the world. That was the, uh, the promise and the prediction that was made. So it was always predestined. It was God's plan that that would happen. And, the, and, and, and they, were, they were ordained and chosen unto that end. Also called the elect. Now the elect, again, it's not in this, this chapter, but it's a principle that's through the Bible. And sometimes it gets confusing because sometimes the elect is talking about the Jews. Sometimes the elect is talking about any Christian. Most of the time that's what it's talking about. Sometimes the elect is talking about Jesus. There's a place where it says the elect and it's talking, about, or he says mine elect and he's talking about Jesus. And so, uh, so how does that, what does that have to do with us today? Well, if we're in Jesus Christ, we're part of him being chosen or and ordained or elect. You know, we, we got the same promises that we had to him. So it's not saying, here's how some people would interpret, interpret predestination. It's not saying that God just predetermined everything that's going to happen on this, on this earth. And if you talk to somebody who, who believes that, they'll say not only that everything's predestined, but they'll basically say you don't have a free will because if you had a free will, that would make you more powerful than God. Now, on the surface, I understand that, but the fact is God created us with a free will so that we could choose Him or not choose Him. Now, He has a foreknowledge because of the fact that He doesn't exist in a specific time and space you know, in, in, in our world. Uh, past, present, future is not an issue to him. He already knows the future. He knows what's going to happen. But from our perspective, we make a decision in the very present to choose Jesus Christ. Now, he knows whether or not we're going to choose him or not. So, so he already sees 
<laughs> the future. It sees us in heaven if we're saved, you know, but that confuses us who are trying to think of it in the present time. We're just thinking like, well, we don't have a free will. I mean, we're just going to do whatever God predestined us to do. And that's not, that's not really true. That wouldn't make sense. And in fact, if you carry that out so far, you're going to say nothing. We can't do anything that surprises God. God wanted everything to happen that happened. Now you're talking about murderers who God ordained to kill an innocent person. You know, people who abuse children. You're thinking God ordained that that would happen? It's, not, it's never been his will that that would happen. You know, uh, it's something that as he gave man free will, as early as the Garden of Eden, and I guess before that, because you think about Satan fell from heaven. And so if he gave the, the, the original angels free will and he gave the saints uh, free will, I mean, the, the, the original human beings free will, you know, then it just seems kind of crazy that people would think, you know, God's just got everything planned out and everybody, everything that's going to happen, that was his will that that would happen. It's not his will that all the evil things in this world happen. It's not his will that any should perish and go to hell. And some people think that he's predestined some to go to heaven and some to go to hell. And that's what they call a limited atonement. All right. If you're, if Calvin, if you heard anyone who's Calvinist and they believe a, what is called a tulip, right? There's five different points. Calvin didn't come up with that uh, acronym, but uh, but he taught basically these principles that somebody else put into that. And the L stands for a limited atonement, meaning that Jesus, when he died, he didn't die for the sins of the whole world because there were some that weren't going to be saved. So he only died for the elect. And uh, that just doesn't make sense because the Bible says, whosoever will may come. He died for the sins of the whole world. And so you kind of have to take some, uh, some huge stretches and some leaps uh, to twist that to make it mean uh, something different than that. Okay, so look at chapter 1, verse 4. According as... Okay, let me back up so that we get this context. Remember, he's talking about the faithful, those who uh, are saints. Uh, grace be unto you. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. I'll come back to those verses according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ uh, to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now that's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of stuff there. And this is the difficult words of, of the apostle Paul. But here's another, uh, there's two things. Okay, first is what I was talking about. He's, he's saying that he, from the foundations of, the Bible says this about Jesus Christ, that he was slain from the foundations of the earth. Okay, so before mankind, you know, in God's foreknowledge, he knew mankind would sin. And before uh, anything was even done, it was foreordained that Jesus Christ would die on the cross. This would be the way of salvation. God understood that what everybody was going to do with their free will. It's an interesting thing, but this is uh, what the Bible teaches. And so the, the predestined was that those who would come to Christ, the elect one that he would, he would bring, it's, it's himself, right? It's Jesus Christ, the word, uh, the word of God. And that all that would come to him would be saved, no matter where, you know, uh, Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter. And then it says that uh, there's also this idea where the predestination is that those are who those who are in Christ. Now you're the child of God, so God God's going to uh, deal with you as His children, and He's going to help to uh, make you better. Okay, doesn't mean you don't have the free will even after you're saved to deny His chase. Uh, you know, to with, withstand against His chastening and correction that He puts in your life. You can resist that. You can quench the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, right? But God's going to work on you because he's ordained you and predestined that you would be uh, part of the church that's going to be glorified and uh, 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 sanctified as when it's presented to God in the kingdom. Okay, so uh, let's look at ch chapter 1, verse 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus... And love unto all the saints. See, oh, that's the wrong verse. Uh, I don't know where I was going there. Ver, uh, no, verse 5. Did we already read that? Having predestinated unto the adoption of the children of Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Covered that one. Verse 11. 
in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Uh, chapter 2, verse 10. Now, here's an, this is important. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Okay, so God's people, you know, we, we got to be careful because we preach salvation is free. Salvation is through grace. All you got to do is put your faith in Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with works, which is true. But he has saved those who put their faith in Jesus Christ unto good works. The good works aren't part, aren't part of your salvation, but if you're saved, that's what you're supposed to be doing, the good works. That was, that's part of his plan, again, that the church would bring forth these good works. Now, some people aren't going to, but those who follow Jesus and, uh, and are the faithful and uh, continue doing these works, and this is what the whole book is, is about, those people are uh, chosen and predestined to good works. All right, we're going to skip on because that was a hard one. <laughs> Number two, okay? Uh, so, you're, the, so he calls them saints. These are names for believers. He calls them saints. He calls them the chosen, the ordained, the predestined. Uh, number three, he calls them the children of God. And I touched on this a little bit in verse five. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So he... Uh, you know, there's this adoption. And the idea of the adoption is that uh, that's one way to look at him being our father is that, you know, he wasn't our father because, uh, you know, we are human. So Adam was our father, that kind of an idea. But now we have God as our father. There's like an adoption. But there's also a fatherhood that the Bible talks about that is a spiritual father. Okay, now that's a little different because what we're talking about there is, the, is how we're actually saved when we're born of the Spirit. The flesh is flesh, the Spirit is Spirit. When, when we're born of the Spirit, God our Father becomes our Father through like this spiritual DNA. Now that's a little different than, be, than what we talk about the adoption. The adoption has more to do with like this, this body, you know, this body's kind of like adopted uh, by the Lord. But there's also, he's also our father spiritually. And of course, we call each other brothers and sisters in Christ. And the, obviously the reason for that is because God uh, is our father if we're in Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, we're talking about the, the new birth, not just being born of the flesh, but uh, born of the spirit. And, uh, you know, again, I think it's interesting. God himself... You know, when, when Jesus Christ was born, God himself, it says, uh, through the Holy Ghost, Mary was with child of the Holy Ghost. And so God put that kind of spiritual DNA and physical DNA, I guess, of God in her womb. And then she also had the human DNA. All right. And so that made him the first fruits. You know, that made him like the only begotten son of the father. It's not that the word of God didn't always exist. We, we believe Jesus always existed in, a, in a, some form. Uh, but at this moment where he becomes man and God at the same time, this is, uh, this is a unique situation. He's the firstborn in that sense. Okay. And at that point, uh, you know, he's God and he's man. And so when you think about this, we, when we accept Jesus Christ, it's, it's kind of a similar idea in the flesh, right? We're human. Now we'll never be a perfect human like Jesus was because we're, we're going to be, we, we've already sinned and we'll continue to sin. But spiritually speaking, the inner man is saved. That part's going to go to be with the Lord forever uh, in, in the resurrection. And so uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I remember I was talking about this with, uh, uh, with Mary, with, I mean, not with Mary, with the wise men. I was talking about uh, bringing gifts. Uh, this was on Wednesday in Iola. And I was saying this, uh, uh, Oh, no, this was, this was about Mary. I'm sorry, I got confused. <laughs> so I was saying about Mary. Mary had Jesus in her womb for nine months. And, uh, and I, I just, the thought came to me one time, like, okay, that was an amazing thing. She was blessed among all women. I mean, she was just, this was a very honorable position. She had the Savior in her womb. Blessed is the womb, right? Uh, and that's, a, that's an honorable position. However, we have the chance, and so did she, by the way, went by faith through Jesus Christ and receiving him, she now had the Savior for all eternity. 
And we can have Christ for all eternity by putting our faith uh, in him. And so, uh, and so that was one of the things that he's called there, uh, that we're called is the children of God. Wonderful name uh, or title or characteristic given to the children. Number four, look at verse seven, chapter one, verse seven, Ephesians one, verse seven. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Now, just the first part of that verse, to whom we have redemption. Now, you'll hear a lot of times the, the Bible will refer to uh, Christians as the redeemed. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And, uh, you know, some people don't understand what that means. Redemption. You know, what does it mean to be redeemed? To me, in my head, I always think about coupons. <laughs> you get, somebody gives you a coupon. It's not really worth much, but it entitles you to something. And then at the day where you actually go and you redeem that coupon, you get the value of what, what it's for. Okay, And so Christians are kind of like that, like we're bought, we're paid for, our salvation's been purchased by Jesus, not by our own works. And so we are redeemed, right? We just haven't actually uh, experienced the final redemption uh, per se. Okay, uh, our eternity has been bought and paid for. And uh, we have, in a spiritual sense, we've cashed it in. Number five, look at the second half of that verse now, verse 7. Ephesians 1, 7, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. So according to the Bible, believers are forgiven. Isn't that a blessing? We're, we're forgiven. You know, it's not just like I'm forgiven now, and if I mess up and I sin tomorrow, I've got to ask forgiveness for that sin. Now, you, sh you should, to be right with the Lord, you should confess to Him your sins and get those right. Uh, but as far as our salvation goes, they're all forgiven. Jesus already paid for them. And that's an important thing for people to remember. Because sometimes people, when you're, when you're giving the plan of salvation, you know, and, and, and people kind of misspeak sometimes, I think, and it's not that huge of a deal uh, I'm, I'm not going to make a big deal about it, but sometimes people will say, you just got to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins when it comes to salvation. Like, you know, that's, that's how you be saved. Well, that could confuse people because really if we had to go list all of our sins and ask forgiveness for them, for them uh, we'd be in big trouble because <laughs> right? I don't remember all of my, all of my sins. So you could just lump them all together and say, forgive me of all my sins. Right. But so now what are you going to do when you sin tomorrow? Right? But that's not what he's saying. He's saying that uh, uh, when you receive Jesus Christ, you are forgiven of all your sins. The moment that you forget, uh, that you forget. What is the deal? Anyway, so uh, uh, so being forgiven is uh, is a wonderful position to have. Now it doesn't have to do with again you know, repenting of all your sins, and every time you do that, then you'll be forgiven or, uh, or something like that. We're forgiven the moment that we receive Jesus Christ, right? That's why He died. He died for the sins of the world, that those would be forgiven. Uh, let's see here. Number, moving right along. Number six, the church. All right, how many have ever heard us uh, believers referred to as the church? Now, that's a tricky one because uh, we're, we believe in what we call the local church. And so sometimes people will, uh, if you say, hey, the church, I'll say, no, 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 it's not the church. It's the churches or it's just, you know, it's just, and I understand where they're going at because there's this belief out there that they call the universal church that says like everybody out there who names the name of Christ and calls themselves a Christian is like under this umbrella and we're all Christians. And uh, the truth of the matter is, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you know, for your salvation alone, you know, just faith alone in Jesus Christ, if you're trusting in your works or something like that, you're not a Christian. So just because you call yourself a Christian doesn't make you part of, you know, uh, of the church. And then the other thing is, okay, so we are part of a church here, right? There's churches uh, all over. There's like-minded brothers and sisters in a radius of five miles. We've got two or three 
you know, like-minded King James only independent Baptists, right? <laughs> but their church is. We conduct our kind of government of this body a little differently than some of those churches do. But we're still brothers and sisters in Christ. But this is our church because the word church just means assembly or congregation. And so when we meet here in this body, you know, we aren't necessarily uh, going to be doing the same things that the church down the street is doing. And the way I like to explain that is, uh, you know, if I go to, I only have a sister, so this is all I can use for an illustration. But if I go to my sister's house, you know, she's my sister no matter what, how, how she conducts her house. But if I go to her house, I'm going to go ahead and obey the rules of her household. If she says, take your shoes off at the door, I'm going to do it because it's her house. But we're still brothers and sisters. <laughs> you know what I mean? She comes to my house, same thing. I've got rules for my family uh, that are that live in my house, but we're still brothers and sisters. And so, so the idea of the local church is kind of like that. Like this church might differ a little bit from that church, but if they're saved, we're still brothers and sisters in Christ. But I want you to see why it's not necessarily wrong to have this idea that everybody who's truly saved, truly believers, are part of the church. Here's what it says in uh, chapter 1, verse 22. And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Okay, so Jesus is the head of the church, which is the body, the fullness of him that fulfilleth all things. Chapter 2, verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do you know this is, this is another mind-blowing thing, okay? But back to the idea of God not, not existing in our present time space. I mean, He does exist in our time space, but, but He's not limited by that, okay? Past, present, future, God exists. So by def, what that means then is... From God's perspective, he, he, who exists in the future, like we're already in heaven. Does that make sense to you? Like, you say, no, no, we're not. We're right here. Yeah, but, but from God's perspective, outside of time, like we're saved, we're already in heaven. You say, well, how do I know that tomorrow I'm going to, I'm not going to mess up and then maybe I won't be. No, no, no. If you're saved, you're in he seated in heavenly places. And this is pretty amazing thought. So uh, this is a, something in my mind that says, okay, well, that makes us the church because guess what? We might not be assembled together in this body. We might not be assembled with the church down the street, but one day we will all be assembled together in heaven and we'll have one head, which is Jesus Christ, which is the head here on earth as well. But he's put different people. He's put uh, pastors and he's put evangelists and he's put, uh, uh, you know, these, these people over the assemblies. Okay. And so uh, one day we will be from our perspective, seated in heavenly places, sitting together around the throne, however you want to say it. But uh, from God's perspective, we're already there. So to call us the church is, uh, is actually, I think appropriate. All right, moving on verse seven. I mean, number seven, look at chapter two, verse one. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses of sin. Verse 5, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you're saved. I love how that how chapter 2 says this several times. Chapter uh, Verse 5, by grace you're saved. Verse 7, uh, uh, let's see here. He showed the exceeding rich, riches of his grace. Verse 8, for by grace are you saved. I mean, there's there's no doubt about it that you're we're saved by the grace of the Lord through faith in Jesus Christ his Son. Uh, all right, so uh, so here number seven is this: the believers are those who are the living, or the word here would be quickened. Uh, quickened is an old word that has to do with life. Okay, so I believe even if a plant, don't they use the word quick if they say like the plant still has life in it? It's got quick or something like that, or quicksand. Why do they call it quicksand? Because it's like alive, <laughs> you know, swallows people up. I think I'm right on that anyway. Uh, but the word in the Bible, when it talks about quick, it's always compared to, you know, you were dead, but he's quickened you. He's made you alive. Okay, so that means, now here's something again that the Calvinists will a lot of times say, well, see, you couldn't make any decisions. You couldn't even call on the Lord because you're dead. 
Well, that's taking that pretty literal, <laughs> okay? But what God is actually saying is, is, from a manner of speaking, like everybody who's not a believer is like the living dead, like zombies just walking around, right? They're going to die and they're dead for all eternity. It says the dead, uh, the dead will, will, will rise again and, be ca- and then all those will be, and the second death will be cast into the lake of fire. Now the Bible does is called the dead in Christ. Most of the time he refers to the dead in Christ as those who are sleeping, right? Because they're only, you know, just temporary, their body's asleep, but their soul's in heaven and they'll live forevermore. It's called eternal life, right? But those who are not saved, those who are not believers, they're dead already. They're dead in their trespasses and sins, okay? So they are walking around dead bodies, <laughs> okay? But you say, well, no, but they're making decisions. Yeah, but they're dead. They're dead. Their spirit has not been quickened. But those who are, are in Christ, they can uh, be called the living or the, those who are quickened. All right, obviously uh, a popular word that we use for believers is the, uh, the saved, chapter 2, verse 8. Again, that's our, the text that we're considering here. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. Now, saved can mean a lot of things. And even in the Bible, you know, sometimes you're saved from destruction. You know, Christians in the uh, tribulation will be saved out of tribulation whenever Jesus comes, right? In the mid, the, around that midpoint time. And that's being saved from destruction, saved from persecution, saved from the things that are going on. But then the Bible talks about, from a spiritual aspect, being saved from hell, right? In other words, you were going to hell, but you've been saved. And so that's a perfect word to use. We like to, uh, to use that. Some people don't understand it. Um, you talked about some people, do you know what it means to be saved? And I've heard people say, yeah, to be saved from yourself. What does that even mean? <laughs> of course, someone did that with faith. We said, oh, yeah, I'm going to heaven because I have faith. And we said, well, what exactly do you have faith in? I got faith in myself. (laughs) Well, you're putting your trust in the wrong person, buddy. (laughs) We got to have faith in Jesus Christ, and then we can be saved, okay? It saves us from the effects of our sin. Uh, Again, we are in this body. We'll still continue to commit sins, but we're saved from the damaging effect of the sin. Uh, We're sealed unto the day of redemption through Jesus Christ, uh, through through the Holy Spirit, which I'll look at in a minute. Uh, let's go to number nine. I told you we're moving right along here. Look at chapter two, verse 10. And this is the verse that follows our text. He says that you're saved by, uh, by grace through faith and that not of yourself is the gift of God. Right? Look at verse 10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, again, somebody will say, see, you're God's workmanship. In other words, you didn't save yourself, which, uh, you know, which we're not, we can't save ourselves. We have to be saved by his grace, right? But we do that by choosing to put our faith in Jesus Christ. And they'll say, no, 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 you're his workmanship. Like he created you, he made you. But that's not what it's saying. Actually, it's saying if you are in Christ, then you're ordained unto good works, okay? He, he, you are his workmanship. He's working. There's an old song we used to sing in children's church. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and faithful he must be. He's still working on me. Who sang that before? <laughs> All right. You're welcome. <laughs> that was free. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so that's a wonderful thought. As a Christian, you're like, all right, well, I'm saved. So... Might as well just go to heaven. Well, no, he's continuing to work on you and he's continuing to use you as a vessel to do good works and to preach the gospel and do all these things as you're on this earth. He's got a goal of using his church, his people to do great things for Christ, uh, who is this all been part of his plan from the very beginning. All right, then finally, uh, number 10, look at chapter two, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, right? Talking about Gentiles who used to be far off from the plan of of God, basically, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Okay, so 
this w phrase is used a lot in the Bible about being in Christ Jesus. And uh, I try to explain this to people because it can be kind of confusing, but this is what baptism is all about. When you talk about somebody being baptized, okay, that doesn't necessarily have to do with water. Now, we do practice water baptism. That's why we're called Baptists. Even historically, that's why they call them uh, Baptists. The Anabaptists were rebaptizers, okay? Because they would take people who were baptized as infants in the Catholic Church and they would say, nope, that doesn't count. You weren't saved. Now you're saved. We're going to baptize you. And they would pr practice what's called believer's baptism. And so, but all that dunking somebody in the water does is symbolize what happens in Christ. Okay. So we're, we're dead. We, we, we are buried with Christ and then we raise to walk in newness of life is, is what we say whenever we baptize them. Right. And so, uh, that's all in Romans chapter six, verse one, uh, the first, yeah, Romans chapter six. And so what happens when you're dunked inside the water by immersion, which is what baptism means, it's silly to sprinkle or pour water on somebody for baptism because that messes up the whole picture. Okay. The picture is being baptized or being immersed into Jesus Christ. So when he says we're in Christ, you know, that's, that's, that's means you're baptized into Christ. And sometimes the word baptized in the Bible does, is talking about being in Christ. Okay. And then we follow through that picture in water baptism, which is also biblical, obviously. Uh, even Jesus went down into the water uh, to be baptized. And then he came out of the water after he was baptized. And he said, he wanted people to follow him and continue doing that. And so we, we follow that to this day. And, uh, and, and this just a sign telling the world that we're in Christ. We followed him into, uh, into, you know, his death, burial, resurrection, and we'll rise up like he rose up, uh, one day as well. But the other thing about being in Christ, this is the greatest part about it all. Look at chapter one, verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, that's faith, right? After that ye had heard the word of truth, the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You had to have the word of God preached to you so that you could know what it is that you're accepting. And then you can accept that as truth. The gospel of your salvation, in whom af also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. All right, you've got a promise made. You are redeemed. You are saved. You are quickened. You're made alive. Uh, you can't die. I mean, you can die physically in this earth, but you'll be just alive in Christ. Uh, you know, you wake up in heaven and you'll be like, man, I can't. I mean, look, don't ever commit suicide, but suicide is not the unpardonable sin like some people think. The Bible actually talks about saved people who committed suicide. It's unfortunate. It's a terrible way to go. It's a bad sin that hurts other people. Uh, but if you said, you know, I just can't take it anymore. I'm going to take my life. You'd wake up in heaven, stand before the Lord and be like, well, you know, I can't even take my own life, right? Because you're going to live forever and ever. But heaven's going to be a lot better than life on earth anyway. But still don't kill yourself. <laughs> so you're sealed unto the day of redemption. You're sealed in Christ. And, uh, and that's a wonderful truth. Jesus even says, uh, you know, that you are in my hand. No man can pluck you out of my hands. He says, my father is greater than I, and no man can pluck you out of my father's hands. Uh, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, you're sealed by Jesus Christ, sealed by the Father. The whole Trinity has, uh, has, has keep, has, is going to keep you saved until the day of redemption, when you're finally literally redeemed. All right, so the conclusion is this. We see that in our text, it's simply a reminder and a, an encouragement, basically, to believers. It's a reminder that it was God's grace that saved us when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to read this uh, the section again, Ephesians 2, and let's start with verse 4. And I'll go chapter 2, verse 4 through verse 10. And uh, so keeping this in mind, all, everything we talked about, about being saved, here's what he says. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. 
Now, some people say that that faith is the gift of God, but really what he's saying here is that through faith, you receive salvation, by the, which is by the, through the grace of God. That's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are, well, let me stop right there. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I meant to just read this and stop, but okay. It still could be, because I haven't done a really great job disproving Calvinism. That wasn't my intent for this message. But let me stop right there. If you could boast by your, if you could boast for your good works, right, uh, that would mean that you did them. And so we understand that we're not saved by our works, you know, lest we, lest we should boast. But the idea is you could boast if you were saved by your works. And if that was the case, right, then that's our, our will, those good works that give us a reason to boast because they're, they're our offerings. They're, they're what we did. And he's saying you can't boast of that. He's saying that, uh, you know, it's not by your works. It's by what Jesus Christ did. That was his gift to you. And so by receiving that gift, you're saved. Okay, let me back up then because uh, I interrupted. For by grace you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at the time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made, uh, made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of, of partition." Uh, <clears throat> I just might as well just keep on reading. <laughs> I already read too far. And he is our peace. Uh, verse 15, he hath abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make it in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off and to them that were nigh, for through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, you're no more strangers and, fellow, uh, and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fit framely, fit, fitly framed together uh, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. What a great verse to use for soul winning, but what even better, if you think about it, a, a, a chapter just to reflect on as Christians and just to, be, just to thank the Lord for His marvelous grace. <clears throat> just one last review, fly through this. Here are some descriptions of believers. Saints, chosen, ordained, predestined, children of God, redeemed, the church, the quickened or the living, the saved, his workmanship, and those who are in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your salvation that we could only receive through your grace. And I thank you, Lord, for giving us a measure of faith that we might have the ability in our free will and our own conscience to choose uh, to receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. I pray if anybody in here hasn't put their faith in Jesus Christ, uh, for their salvation. They would do that today. Help those who are going out soul wanting to preach this message boldly and, and without reservation. And I pray, Lord, you be lifted up and glorified, uh, not our own works by which we could boast, Lord, but we want to do great works through you. And I pray that you would be, uh, you would provide us that uh, the opportunity, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.